In the last 15 years in Australia, there's been a burgeoning of small wineries that concentrate on the production of fine table wines. They're to be found dotted right through the country's traditional wine producing areas. But during that time, quietly and surely, an area new to 20th century consumers of Australian wine has established itself. Here, all the wineries are small and their entire output aspires to the highest possible quality. To the surprise of many Australian wine consumers, the area is the island state of Tasmania. But Tasmania's association with wine is not just a product of the last 15 years. In 1823, Bartholomew Broughton planted a commercial vineyard near Hobart. Broughton's first vintage of 300 gallons was released in 1827. By 1848, that first vineyard, then owned by Captain Swanston, was producing 1,600 gallons of red wine, sparkling champagne, sherry and liqueurs annually. According to the Hobart Town Courier of November the 1st that year, the claret will be found superior to any imported and promising to exceed in flavour the first growth of France. But although vines were planted throughout the state, commercial winemaking had virtually ceased by 1860. The climate was particularly suitable for the production of table wines, but the colonial taste was for port and sherry. And for these, a warmer climate was necessary. And of course, Tasmania was an Anglo-Saxon society. Apart from the home-inspired landscapes the settlers etched for themselves, they brought in food, customs and drinking habits. Beer and rum quenched the thirsts of the colony. And especially during the times of conflict with France, English Tasmanians were certainly not going to partake of French-style table wines. So these marketing problems and the lack of agricultural entrepreneurs with the flair and backing to persevere with grape production drew a curtain across the Tasmanian wine industry. A curtain which remained closed for a century. The Australian wine palate has been conditioned on wines that come from warmer regions. Starting with ports and sherries in the 19th century and moving to table wines in the latter half of this century. Through historical circumstance, palate conditioning, publicity and the occasional myth, we have naturally believed the Barossa and Hunter Valleys, Rutherglen and other warm mainland regions were synonymous with the production of fine table wines. But if we compare these Australian wine growing areas with the traditional regions of Europe, we notice that the classic French, German and Italian vineyards are situated in cooler locations. Grapes ripen slowly in cool climates. They're fruitier and the full flavour has a chance to develop. The world's finest table wines are made from grapes grown in cool, temperate climates. Bordeaux is the warmest region in which classic table wines are made, and Tasmania's climate approximates that of Bordeaux. The executive of the Vineyards Association of Tasmania has just finished one of its meetings. Among items for discussion has been a major achievement for the industry. The Tasmanian government has committed itself to legislate for the introduction of appellation control, setting Tasmania in a unique position in the Australian context. Now, over lunch, there's a chance to talk about, taste and compare the product of their mutual obsession. From the beginning, 
uh, we formed the Vineyard Association of Tasmania, uh, we tried to establish guidelines, we tried to establish respect for quality, we tried to establish uh, that what we would put in on our labels would be exactly what the label said. Uh, we tried to establish the fact that we would only make wines from grapes grown 100% on the property. Having started that way, it's difficult for people to remain outside. They've joined it. Claudio El Corso was one of the fathers of the rebirth of the Tasmanian wine industry. He planted experimental vineyards at his Marilla estate near Hobart in the late 1950s. The Marilla label now adorns some of Australia's most sought after premium wine. Fortunately, the development here and perhaps this is due to the scepticism that existed in the rest of Australia, has been slow and specialised, so that we are seeing the emergence of specialised vineyards that produce wines of a distinctive quality. It's not just a question of climate or soil, uh, shelter, uh, freedom from pests and so on, which is important. But the other factor is the human factor aiming at perfection, never thinking that we have uh, achieved, uh, continuing that elusive search for quality. conditions here uh, that permit the slow ripening of the grapes. Well, good morning. Good morning. Beautiful yes. day, isn't it? Beautiful day. We prepare it specially. That was very kind of you. Very thoughtful. Well, we do it every year. We have a special uh, Bacchus in the seeds with us. <laughs> In Tasmania we have this unique mellow condition and a slow autumn that merges into winter over three months. And this enables us to ripen our grapes to perfection. We pick at the end of the cycle. The leaves are falling, the leaves are yellow, they fulfill their function, the grapes are perfectly ripe and they have therefore all the flavours in. This means slow ripening, they've been ripening for six months. This is the key to Tasmanian quality. Mi dispiace che non ci sia Piera qui, sai come gli piacerebbe? Parlavamo ieri sera con, non so se tu te la ricordi, la Diana Harrison e mi ha detto, dice, ogni volta che venivo a casa Piera mi abbracciava. Tasmania is a mountainous place, a hilly place uh, and conditions very dramatic. I said Tasmania is good for viticulture. I should have been more accurate and I should have said certain areas of Tasmania, certain patches even, as you find in Europe, are, are very good 
and there may be uh, another area only a few kilometers from it. That is no good at all, either because it gets a spring frost or something like that. We have some unique conditions for specialized viticulture, but we have no conditions at all for mass viticulture. Mass viticulture is the last thing on Graham Wilshire's mind. Graham is the founder and winemaker of Heemskirk Wines. I think quality of wine, uh, excellence in wine, is the most important thing both to this company and to the whole Tasmanian wine scene. Uh, without quality, I, I think, well, we may not as well grow wine. Graham planted his first vineyard in 1966 near Launceston. He moved to the present site of Heemskirk Wines on the northeast coast in 1975. We're only paying on, on weight you picked this year, so it won't be too much, will it? <laughs> 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 Mmm. But they're fairly clean, not a lot of them, mildew. I think all good wines commence in the vineyard. And so we devote much of our time and our best staff to care and every detail in the vineyard so that the grapes are, are perfect when they come to the winemaker. Once we have the very best quality grape that we can grow in the winemaker's care, then it really is a matter of nurturing those grapes, uh, the wine, uh, and a matter of cleanliness, hygiene, and as much care as possible to produce the highest quality wine. I don't think there's any room for compromise in the Tasmanian scene. I think the markets we have established and, and hope to uh, increase both in Australia and overseas is built entirely on quality. When Graham Wilshire moved to the northeast coast in 1975, his neighbour, Andrew Pirry, had already been there for a year, planting the vineyard that is now known as Piper's Brook. We arrived here following um, a study which uh, I did to locate an area uh, in Australia that was comparable in climate to some of the great French vineyards and uh, it was a climatic survey which uh, eventually pinpointed this area as being uh, very similar in climate um, to some of the areas in central France which are famous for their quality wine. The philosophy behind this venture was to emulate the French tradition in many ways to produce a product similar to theirs. So we not only chose a climate that was similar, but we're also using French techniques of growing, which include uh, close row spacings and very intensive management of the vineyard during this growing season. We can now understand why the French have evolved these methods over hundreds of years. They do work, they give you very ripe fruit, even in cool climates. And we're able to pick um, 
fruit with sugar contents, in some cases higher than the uh, mainland areas. I think it is fair to say that um, the raw material from Tasmania, the, the ripe grapes, uh, will make themselves into great wines more easily than elsewhere because they're naturally endowed. Also the climate is much milder during the winemaking period and uh, the juices are naturally cool. There's no need for artificial aids to uh, prevent aeration and oxidation. varieties that we have planted have each in turn proven to be uh, very successful and in some cases they're rated amongst the best in Australia for their type. We just want about a half a bucket of Pinot culture. in Tasmania. Tasmania, the Pinot Noirs have that colour. Okay. The goal in this venture is to produce about uh, 10,000 dozen bottles a year. We see that as being uh, a necessary part of the venture, that uh, we're not aiming to get big, we're just aiming to get better. Claudio Alcorso's Marilla estate is now managed by his son Julian whose belief in small is beautiful is so strong that he intends to concentrate on the production of just one wine, a Pinot Noir. This decision was taken after years of viticultural experimentation at Marilla and the family's other vineyard at Brim Creek on the east coast. A hundred miles or so north of Brim Creek, Jeff Bull, an ex-press photographer and abalone diver, has planted his Freysenet vineyard. He's one of a growing number of newcomers to Tasmanian wine growing, but his conviction about the importance of quality to the industry is just as strong as that of his longer established colleagues. It's only a young vineyard, it's just starting to bear and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the six varieties produce here on the east coast. There's no other vineyard within 100 miles of this vineyard and uh, it, it's a time factor that one has to wait many years to find out uh, just how it's going to perform. maximum I look at that's the total production I, I could see that I could handle if I go any larger I would uh, it involve um, just 
too big a machinery, too many people, and uh, I don't think I could handle the, the quality side of it that, I, that I'm going for. This has been uh, my total concept of the vineyard, that the, uh, the wine be consumed on the East Coast with uh, East Coast seafood, because we, we produce here the best craze in the world. And uh, we're now growing oysters, which are superb, and our scallops are second to none. Jeff Bull is the first to admit that he has much to learn as a winemaker. His 1984 dry white was made at Marilla Estate by Julian Alcorso. This sort of cooperation with a competitor may seem strangely eccentric, but it's typical of the way the industry in Tasmania operates. That's the beauty thing about this industry. We're all, we're all in each other's pockets all the time. And there's no uh, real embarrassment about asking, you know, saying, oh, I've got a problem, you know, uh, what yeast are you using this year, or I'm having a problem with this particular yeast or that yeast, or I need another barrel, or can I borrow your bottling machine? Because we're all, we've all got a common aim, really, and that's to establish the industry as a viable, uh, unique and quality-based industry, and we're all, we're all working towards that, so that's good, yeah. Big wineries in, um, on the main then in warmer areas where grapes are not in sound condition have, have a lot of technology involved in must correction in uh, pH adjustment, um, uh, iron exchange equipment, that sort of thing that, uh, that we don't need here because the grapes grown produce uh, the right amount of acid, the right amount of sugar, and usually very low pHs, which uh, um, uh, mean that you know, they really don't need adjustment. Technology is a great leveller. It'll make very good wines out of very poor grapes. It'll never make great wines. The Tasmanian winemaker's pursuit of quality reflects a new trend in Tasmanian endeavour towards things that are truly excellent, that reflect the producer's care for his or her work. The pursuit of excellence extends also to quality of life and fine living, and particularly to good, fresh food. The range of foods available in European countries provides tourists with an incentive to travel through the landscape and sample excellent local produce. The same possibility exists in Tasmania, which produces Australia's premium foods. Fine table wines are not meant for coffee. Their true purpose is to accompany fine foods and to complement delicate flavours through the course of a meal. Although Tasmanian wines aren't cheap, it seems silly to skimp on the wine when you take a lot of time and trouble to prepare a fine meal or spend a lot of money buying one. Tasmanian wines are sold around the world and in all Australian states. But Tasmanian vignerons have a special image of their wines being enjoyed with local produce in various regions of the state.
Tasmanian wines are wines to be taken seriously. They have been acclaimed throughout Australia and Europe, and Tasmanian vignerons believe that their state will one day be the most highly regarded wine region in the country. Their opinion has been reinforced by the announcement of a joint venture between the French champagne house Louis Rodera and Graham Wilch's Heemskirk Vineyard. The joint venture between Heemskirk and, and Louis Rodera is, I think, one of the most important uh, ventures into the quality market in Australia. It's, it's very important in the international scene that a company the prestige of Louis Rodera should consider a little island like Tasmania. We as a company have had a long association through other directors of this company with the, the House of Rodera and over a number of years they have been watching the Tasmanian development, the quality of our, our grapes and our wine and after exhaustive studies they think that Tasmania is a place where they can grow wine suitable of the name of Rodera. The French still produce the best table wines in the world and we have tried to uh, not emulate but make wines of a Tasmanian style, uh, of a Tasmanian quality to the same standards as French, looking only for quality. There is a market for quality, always, in everything. And what's more, when uh, we have economic recessions, and we all know in our system we do get uh, economic recessions, the segment of the market that is hit, always, it's a bulk one, and quality continues to sell. If you want to be cynical about it, you could say that the people that uh, moan about the recession in the wealthier segment uh, of the community, they moan, but they still have enough money to buy good wine. <laughs>